Hello, my name is John Cho. I'm from Hawaii. I live on the island of Maui. Um, I worked for the University of Hawaii for many years from 1974 I started as an assistant professor and until 2008 when I ended up as a full professor there. But a lot of the work in the Kola Keches, I started working um, probably in the 1990s. Um, there's a big disease, uh, fungal disease that attacks the leaf and the plant that, that kills and decimates uh, in many countries uh, around the world. In Hawaii, we have that problem. Uh, Hawaii grows taro, um, and we make the, they make poi out of it. They take the bottom, the corms, and cook it, and grind it up and make poi, and they serve it to, and that's one of the um, major staples for the Hawaiians in the early days. And nowadays, it's mainly served at uh, um, luau's and things and for the tourists. But they, the native, the, the people, local people do eat it. Uh, as an occasional local dish. And I, so I started, I, I did some consulting work for USAID people. They had some virus problems on some of the vegetable crops in, in the uh, South Pacific Islands, uh, Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, and um, Cook Island. And they, I was uh, specializing in virus diseases in my research work at, at the University of Hawaii. Um, they came, they, they found me somehow, and they asked me if I would like to come and consult down in those islands to try to solve some of the virus problems they're having in, in the South Pacific. Um, when I was there, I, I consulted down there from in the mid-1990s for three years, um, and they grow in, particularly in Samoa, they grow a lot of taro for consumption, and they they cook it and eat it like a pota potato. They cook it and bake it, slice it up, and, and eat it like a potato. So I saw that some of the crops growing there from some of the growers. I was taken around by USAID people, and the second year I went, I, first year I went there, it was a fabulous crop. They had a lot of it all all on the hillsides, growing well and. They, the second year when I went there, apparently uh, this fungal disease called Phytophthora colocaceae was introduced into the country, apparently smuggled in on infected material by some of the chiefs, so they, the chiefs could get through quarantine very easily without having their plants inspected. And uh, it's, it's thought that they were the ones that brought it in and caused the disease. So. In, in one year, their crop, they lost probably 80% of the crop from this disease. It just wiped the crop out. So when I saw this, I said, and we, Hawaii has that problem too, but uh, it's mainly a wintertime problem when we have a lot of rain, and it might kill, and we lose maybe 50, up to 50% of our crop. So at that time, I started um, doing some breeding, and I'm, breeding mainly for trying to get disease resistance to this uh, fungus. I, I went to the, the areas where Colocasia is native to, which is in Southeast Asia, and make collections to bring it back to use in my material for breeding um, to get this resistance into the material. And there was already reports from other people that researchers had done done work in that area that had found some disease resistant material found in Thailand. I got those material. So I've got material from Thailand, Vietnam, um, South Indonesia, India, and brought those back to Hawaii to be doing in my breeding. So during my breeding program I had was doing breeding with our, our Hawaiian varieties that were being grown for poi to, to get this resistance. And in 2003, um, Tony Avon from North Carolina, from Plant Delights Nursery, came to visit me. And he brought his wife at that time uh, as, one of, as their anniversary. And one of the things he wanted to do is find somebody at the university. He said, somebody at the university must be doing some research and breeding of colocasia. And he came to, to, 
to Maui, came to our research center, went and talked to our secretary. And I guess he said, the secretary was jumping up like a ju Mexican jumping bean. Dr. Cho, Dr. Cho. <laughs> and she, she called me on the intercom and said, there's somebody looking to, to talk to you. And I met, that's the first time I met Tony in 2003. And he says, uh, I, I, are you doing some breeding in tarot in colocation? I said, yeah. Uh, would you like to see some of my material? So I showed him my breeding fields. And he was uh, just amazed. And he said, did you know that this is can make, it's being grown as an ornamental in, in North Carolina? And I said, no. I said, I'm only looking at it for food value. And he, he said, I showed him material and he said, Let's uh, do a collaboration where you can try to, try to develop some uh, ornamental types. And I said, okay, that, that uh, seems like a challenge. So at that, in, from 2003, I sent all my potential material to Tony in North Carolina and, uh, and came every year to evaluate material. I, and so I started breeding for the ornamental value of it. And he showed me what what was uh, being sold as ornamentals, so I could use that as a, as a guide to where I should be going and what direction. Mm -hmm. And by coming every year, sometime usually in September, we sat down, looked at my material, and then, dis then discuss uh, what needs to imp be improved, where, what direction we can go to. I said, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. And so that's, here we are, you know, I've got, got a lot of colorful um, plants. Here's one right here that's uh, a new one um, with that uh, bright white in the black of the leaf. And that material, the white, came from Nancy's Revenge that came from the Caribbean. Somebody found it and was selling it in the ornamental market. So in that play, I, I improved it to a, a different and more elegant plant, I think. So this year, here is one, one of the plants. It's, uh, it's a matte finish and it's got uh, kind of a velvet, velvety black colored leaf. But uh, it's the, the, the thing about uh, colocasia, it's got these um, calcium oxalate crystals like spinach and well, Diffenbachia. Uh, it's also got some um, proteinases. Uh, so the, the, the uh, calcium oxalate has these raffets that will, will kind of, when you eat it uh, raw, it'll kind of scratch your, your mucous membranes or your throat and, and the proteinases will work and start your itching in your, in your throat. And so uh, one of my goals was try, trying to breed a, away from that to make it less of an itch, for, particularly for food, food material, so that people wouldn't have this drastic uh, reaction to uh, colocasia. So this, this one, this one we call, we're calling now uh, Hawaiian Luau, we're going to name, and it's uh, edible. So we found that the corn on the bottom can be sliced up and fried and, and eaten like a French fries. So the, that characteristic is usually a, a lower um, calcium oxalate uh, concept, um, level. Now, they were asking me, can you, this trip, can you eat the leaves? And gen generally um, in Hawaii, the food taros that have low oxalic acid that you can eat the corms, you generally can eat the leaves. So what they do is, what they make is what is called uh, luau leaf. So they take the newly unfurled leaf of the taro, Here, here's one, this is in the center, it's just, just open. Mm -hmm. So they take that with a little bit of the patio, and generally you take four, three or four leaves. So we'll take, we'll take three here. Uh, 
and they I'm going to simulate this as a piece of meat. So they put, they can put meat, and they'll put like salmon in in their wrap, and they'll wrap it up in a ball like this. And they usually use tea leaves. You don't, which is cordyline. You don't have cordyline here, so I'm mimicking cordyline with the ginger leaf because what the cordyline does is when you wrap it, they wrap it and tie it in a knot. They usually do two, so you put two and completely enclose the colocasia leaves that you're going to eat inside the leaves. And you, you put it in a steaming pot and steam it for an hour. The reason you have the, the leaf the coralline leaf is that it doesn't break down in, in, in the cooking. It stays firm. So then you can take it and open it up and the inside will be all cooked. The meat and the leaves. The leaves are have the consistency of spinach when you eat it. And it but it's got a, a nicer flavor to it than spinach. So you eat that, and then also the meat and the salmon and things inside. So, and that, this is what the Hawaiians call as lao lao. Lao lao is a leaf. Okay, I think that's about it. <laughs>